Hey, uh, my name is Pastor Mitch, one of the pastors on staff. Excited, blessed, honored to open up Jonah with you this morning as we continue in our, our study of the minor prophets. Minor as in they're short, not in their importance in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but it's where the Lord has us in our study. If you need a Bible this morning, we can get you one in the aisles. If you don't have one, you need one. Uh, so grab that, open it up. Would you find 2 Kings this morning with, you, with me? Uh, 2 Kings chapter 14 is where we're going to start. A little bit of an intro and chapter 1 all wrapped up into one quick sermon here. Buckle up. Try to stay with me. It's a lot. I know. I'm sorry. But it is what it is. All right? Jonah is a very different book than, than the books of prophecy. It is a book of prophecy. Uh, but in it, there's from the Lord, a word from the Lord, uh, five words in Hebrew of prophecy. Translated to eight in English. That's it. A little bit more prophecy, but not necessarily from the Lord himself, but just out of the mouth of the prophet Jonah uh, would be shared. And we'll look at this morning in chapter one. Uh, but really more of a book of history mostly about uh, this guy Jonah and what we can learn from him rather than it being about the message or the message to the people. Now, obviously, things to be learned and to grow from in that, but uh, mostly about this guy uh, Jonah. He's a contemporary of Amos, who we just studied a couple weeks ago and was in that series. They're serving and being prophets for the Lord in and about the same time under the same king, that being Jeroboam II, uh, there in Israel in uh, the northern country, and Jonah, uh, unlike Amos and unlike Obadiah, last week shows up elsewhere in Scripture. This is different than where we've been. He shows up both in the Old Testament and in the New. Jonah has a message from the Lord, which is also different in that it is not for the people of God. Well, at least not the Israelites or the kingdom of Judah but to outside of God's people and country, uh, that to the capital city of Assyria, uh, Nineveh. Assyria is considered by historians to be the most evil, violent, vile people group that has ever been on earth. This city of Nineveh uh, would stretch, we're told in chapter three, uh, a three-day journey to cross it the size of this capital city. The atrocities, ridiculous, uh, that are recorded for us in history of this people group, and I will spare you of them. Jonah, this prophet of God, explicitly tells us multiple times in this book, he is trying to flee the presence of God. He should know better. David knew better in Psalm 139 when he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I make my bed in hell, you are there. It's not possible, and yet he's trying. It's not possible, and yet you and I do this, try to do this in our lives. Been far too many seasons in my life, and pains me to say probably will still be so, where I tried to flee the presence of God. I taught on Jonah five years ago, 2019, and the major takeaway and challenge for me and presented to the church was this, that I think a lot of times, far too often, more than we would like to admit, we come to church in order to flee the presence of God. I think that sounds weird. I know it does, but we do it. And we come to church and we do the church thing and we sit here for an hour and a half and maybe we worship and raise our hands and we listen to the message and then we go live however the heck we want to live outside these walls. And we feel good about it because we did the church thing. And then we're going to do it again and again and again. It becomes habit and repetition. And somehow we've turned his house into a place to escape him. Title for this morning, chapter one, would be Prodigal Prophet. Not because he lives lavishly, as the word prodigal would mean, but because of the parallels between him and the prodigal son who would tell his dad, give me my inheritance now. You're as good as dead to me. I don't want to live in your presence. I'd be better off not in your presence to the dad who represents God the Father. I'm going to go live however I want. Do my thing. 
comes to his senses, and comes back to the Father. You'll see that to a degree in Jonah chapter 1 and 2. 3 and 4, Jonah starts to become, does become, exemplifies the older son. Where he does what the Lord asks, but with a bad heart. Doesn't agree with it. Doesn't want it. Doesn't want this message of mercy to be extended to the Ninevites. Disagrees with God. Does what he asks. Does it with a grumpy heart. And as the older brother would do and say to the father, I lived exactly how you wanted me to. I didn't do all of the things he did. And yet, where's my party? Where's my ring? Where's my shoes? Where's my fatted calf? Where's my stuff? Not living in the blessing of the presence of the father. Not what that son was living for. And both of which traps that we fall into constantly and continually. And I pray that we would learn and grow how not to do that even this morning. Jonah, however, uh, is one of the most debated and controversial books in scripture on its validity, reality, due to the fish. That he would be swallowed up, live in the fish three days, three nights, and then be spit up on the shore and then go in some sort of obedience and deliver this message uh, to the Ninevites. We don't know what fish that would be. Science can't prove or point to any fish that it might be. Could have been. Easily for it to be a fish that only existed one time or doesn't exist now. Beautiful word in chapter one where it says that the Lord prepared a great fish. I always wonder when. When did you prepare? Right then and there, in the moment, like big fish going to swallow this guy up. Or was it like a long time ago? I think both are equally cool. He's like, one day I'm going to need this fish for this Jonah prophet dude who's not going to want to do what I do. And so I'm going to get it ready and we're going to make sure it's not caught or speared or whatever. Eat a lot, get big, swallow them up whole. Both are awesome. I find it kind of funny that um, we love to teach kids this story. I think because of the fish. You have a nationalist, borderline, or probably so racist, suicidal, running from God, prophet. Teach it to the kids, baby. (laughs) Throw it up on the flannel graph. It looks cool. It's probably because of that stuff. My oldest is five, his name's Bo, goes to school here last year in preschool. Bo was preaching on the playground. I love that. Preaching on the playground, teaching Jonah. <laughs> Not only are we teaching it, which we should, I believe that all scriptures God breathe and, and is good for our teaching and our correction and for us to learn and grow, no matter the age. Just think specifically in a story like Jonah, we gotta do it very carefully. We want to make this guy running from the Lord or the presence of the Lord some sort of hero, but to learn from his mistakes and his mess ups. Find it beautiful. We can't really dive into it, but a piece that would, for me, confirm uh, the validity, the reality of this story is in the writing of it. And you see liter- literary symmetry between both chapters one and three and chapters two and four. Okay? Uh, you see parallel between the two. Verse one in both one and three is God's word comes to Jonah. The message to be conveyed in verse two, the response of Jonah, good and bad. Verse four, word of warning. Verse five, response of the pagans. Verse six, response of the leader of the pagans. Verse seven, their better response than Jonah's. And then you can look at two and four and say, oh, look at the symmetry between how God is trying to to show and bring grace to Jonah, this guy living in sin through the fish, through the worm and the vine that we'll get to later. Here's here's the mind-blowing part, all right? You're like, yeah, a good author would write that. Yeah, it's the best author ever. His name is God. It's perfect. Here's what's crazy. When it was written, no chapters, no verses. That's crazy that then it would be broken down and written that way so perfectly and beautifully. 
A little bit more would be where we are in 2 Kings. And this is different. We have Jonah showing up outside of his book in Scripture, unlike Amos and Obadiah again. He shows up here for the first time and the only other time in the Old Testament in 2 Kings. Have I prayed? Let's pray. Lord, I love you so much. I thank you for your word, the story. God, would you teach and grow us, challenge us this morning, me. Lord, I love you. I thank you. Praise your name. And it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now we're good. Second Kings 14, verse 23, it says, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Araba, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Helper. Okay, so here you have Jonah doing the work the way he's supposed to. Delivering the word of the Lord. Delivering the word of the Lord to an evil king, Jeroboam II. And he would then expand the territory and the kingdom of Israel at that time from the Dead Sea up until modern day Syria. Far greater than what Israel even is now would be the territory. Even in their wickedness and evilness, as a king and as a nation, God would use this prophet Jonah to speak a word, they follow and expand the territory. Interestingly, we studied in Amos, to this same king, another prophet, that being Amos, would come and reduce those borders, take away kingdom because of the evilness that was being exemplified and then followed by the nation of Israel. All this to show and to point to the importance and what we're supposed to hone in on, that being this man, Jonah, in his book and in his study. Furthermore and greater than, Jonah shows up in the New Testament multiple times because we have multiple gospels. And it's from none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that Jonah is referred to. And for me, all I need to trust and believe in the reality of this story. And more than that, the book. This should be commonplace in the life of Christians to say, I don't maybe understand it. I don't see how that could be. Maybe science can't prove it, but my God says it is. And so I believe it. If you understood everything about him, he wouldn't be God. Wouldn't be. Paul loves to talk about the mysteries of God. These are to be a constant in our life and we're supposed to get into a position where we're comfortable with, hey, well, how did that work? I don't know. But is it so hard for a God who made everything? Who the breath you're breathing in your lungs right now, he's putting there? For him to be like, I need a fish that a guy can survive in for three days and three nights. Jesus tells us this, Matthew 12, starting in verse 38. Then some scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Come on. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Credible. If you believe and you accept, and I pray that you do, that Jesus, the Son of God, came, lived a perfect life so that he might be your 
blameless, spotless sacrifice, died on the cross, was buried and dead for three days. And that God the Father brought him back to life. The miracle of a guy living in a fish for three days is not that big of a deal. Neither are that difficult for God. But the latter, that being Jesus, far more important. As the fish becomes a salvation for Jonah and unwanted, I believe at the time, so the parallel and the grave of our Savior becomes ours. And not just yours and mine, but the world's, including this nation Jonah doesn't want to go to, the evilest and most vile generation and people group the world has ever known. All right, let's go. Jonah 1, here we go. Jonah 1 says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a great ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Explicitly, multiple times, I, he, Jonah, trying to flee the presence of God. Get away from it. He tells us and would explain in chapter four, verse two, why. He knows that his God, the God that he's supposed to be the mouthpiece of, the prophet of God, is a merciful God. Generous and graceful. And he does not want that message to go to this people. Disagrees. Says, God, I don't think that's good. I don't want him to know it. I'm going to go the other way. Notice with me, he determines in his heart where he's going before he goes to the port. He doesn't just come down to the port and be like, where's the ship going the furthest? No, no, no. The guy determines before he goes to the port, I'm going to go as far as I possibly can. That being Tarshish, the southern tip of Spain and Portugal. Hebrew, uh, they would have Tarshish be a word of their largest, greatest sailing vessels. The ships that would carry the most and go the furthest were Tarshish ships because that was the end of the known world in the direction opposite of Nineveh. He goes down, he in fact finds the boat, pays the fare and gets in it once again in order to flee the presence of of God. This idea uh, to leave the presence of God is not uh, common in scripture. Doesn't show up all that often. Most notably for me, it shows up in the book of Job and not from somebody human, but from the devil himself. Job's one, probably potentially my favorite book in the Old Testament, Jonah right there with it. And there's unreal parallels between the two. I love Job because it absolutely explodes and destroys some common misbeliefs that maybe we've been taught or that we're comfortable sitting in uh, as Christians. One of them being, and you probably heard it said or have even said maybe to someone or to your kids that wherever God is, evil cannot be. You read the book of Job? A conversation between the devil and God in his presence because we're told three times, that then the devil would leave his presence. Very important, I believe, that phrase is, because there the devil is having a conversation with God. Kind of just explodes that. Also explodes that uh, bad things happen because of sin. Now, that's not wrong, but not, it's not only true that all bad things happen because of sin. Bad things just happen, or sometimes bad things happen because of good things. Sometimes it is the devil. I think rarely in our lives, we like to blame the devil a lot for our problems or our sin or falling into temptation. Like, well, the devil made me do it. Demons made me do it. You are sinful enough in yourself, as am I, to just mess up and cause problems in our life and sin on our own. And here you have God saying, 
which would you want this said of you? Hopefully, yes, but in actuality, where do we land? Have you considered my servant Job to the devil? And it starts this whole story in the book of Job. It's important for us this morning because Jonah is living in sin. And you're about to see a storm thrown his way because of his sin. And the thing about sin and storms is sin always produces storms. And what we don't like to give credit to, and maybe as a belief or thinking of the non-Christian world, or someone contemplating Christianity, is that yes, you, in fact, your sin does affect other people. And we'll see this storm affect guys that were just about their business, sailing their boat and their goods to the end of the world. Okay, Chap- chapter one, verse four, it says this, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, please tell us. For whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? He said to them, I am Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me in the sea, that the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to the land. But they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him in the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay, again, sin always produces storms. Fact. Always happens. Now, not all bad things that happen are because of sin. Okay? Said this, established this. But guaranteed, always, your life is more difficult. Your life is worse off. You bring trouble upon your life, your family, your friends, your workplace, your neighborhood when there is sin. Your relationship not from God's perspective, but yours, is damaged in sin. Isaiah would tell us that it was our iniquities that separate us from God. And the more comfortable we get with sin, the more comfortable we get away from the Lord. Sin produces storms. What's beautiful about it is a lot of times, and for these people specifically, they get put in a predicament difficult situation, they're throwing their livelihood out of the boat because of this dude's sin. You want to talk about a storm, not just the wind and the waves, but these guys are like losing their jobs because of Jonah's sin. Like, well, that's not fair. No, it's not. Life's not fair. Welcome to the club. It's not perfect. And all your problems aren't solved when you meet or accept to believe in God. Life is hard. Actually, it gets harder when you become a Christian. And yeah, we can be like, oh, it's persecution and people making fun. Really, it's because there's a war that happens inside of us. 
because we're still flesh and our flesh is fighting against the spirit. Trying to live for the Lord and open up this word. Open it up and say, how am I, how am I to live? And it explains everything, right? What you should do, what you shouldn't do, what you should wait for. What the Lord wants you to do and be. It's crazy because for you and for me, like Jonah, we have received the word of the Lord. Are we going to live in it? But I know because it's the same for me as it is for you. We leave this place and the world's shouting at us everything opposite of what the book says. What's good for you, how you should live. What purpose in life is. And we're like, well, what is good? What is good for me? And Jonah's in a spot where he gets a word from the Lord, as you and I have gotten a word from the Lord. And he's like, I don't think it's good. Nope. I don't think it's good for those people to hear it. That line from the sailors is incredible. When they say and they pray that their lives would not be judged by throwing this man overboard. Listen, we know the story because we've been taught it since we were kids. In the church, out of the church. Referenced. Fish comes and swallows them up. They're not expecting that. Ain't no way these guys in the boat are thinking, well, just throw them in and the fish will come get him. We'll be, they think they're killing him, and so does Jonah. Don't get this twisted. Jonah's solving two problems, one stone. He's going to solve their problem, and he's going to be dead and not need to go do what he doesn't want to do. And God's like, I got other plans, buddy. The reality is you and me, we, we're his. Whether you choose to be or not, whether you accept to be or not, you're the Lord's. Made you. Knew you before you were born. Was thinking about you before the foundations of the earth were ever laid. God was thinking about you and me and everyone. Thinks about you more than you think about you. More than you ever could think about you. You think you're selfish and you think about yourself a lot. You're first loser in comparison to God. Constantly, always thinking about all of us. He is God, whether you believe it or not. And as we even saying today, every day, or not every day, but one day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. It's really a question of, are you going to be of use to God or used by God? And there's a more comfortable side to be on. Not of comfort, but it is a better place to be. I struggle uh, a lot with sleeping. I uh, find it very difficult, not because I have three little children or that it's blisteringly hot this week. Uh, sleep is hard. It's been hard for a long time uh, in my life. And I know the verses, it says... That the Lord will give sleep to those who love him. And I'm praying for it constantly. But the dude running from God is sleeping in the boat. I love the, what do you mean sleeper? That's, what, that's me to this guy. How? Okay. If that was me, I would be throwing up, hurling over the side of the boat. One, because I get seasick. And two, because I could not. No way I could sleep knowing I was living my life in such a way that I was intentionally trying to actively, explicitly flee the presence of God. Sure, do I fall into that? Yes. We all make mistakes. But to be actively doing it and to say, getting a word for the Lord and being like, you know what? No. The young prodigal to be like, you're wrong. Absolutely not. And those sailors say to the Lord, God, you have done as you pleased. What a position to be in. 
Timothy Keller in his book on Jonah would put it so simply and perfectly uh, to me and says, God is more dedicated to our good and more aware of what that is than we are. A question of belief, question of obedience. If you've been a Christian for any little amount of time, you've lived in these moments where you've gone through something, you've been in something, and you're like, no way, this is going to turn into good. No way, this is, and then you're like, oh, wow. Praise the Lord. I would be sick to my stomach, not just because of the sea, but because of the position and the knowing position uh, being pursued. The New King James tells us uh, in the margin that the word, kind of a coincidence, for sent, when it says that he sent a storm, uh, is more literally hurled the storm. It's not like, because he can do this and just say to the wind and the sea, like, hey, break that ship apart. He's actively doing this in pursuit of this man who says, I'm going to run from the presence of God. I'm going to flee it. I don't like what he's asking me to do. I do not think it is good. And I'm going to go as far as I can from him. And our God is so good that he's like, I'm coming after you. Our God is so good that this man, this prophet, this mouthpiece of God would prophesy from the boat. When after being caught and confessing to his sin, notice with me, confession is not enough. Not enough to just admit that you do wrong and that you're a sinner and that you need a savior because the storm after his confession grows stronger. More tempestuous, it tells us after his confession. And he prophesies and he says, hey, if you throw me in, the sea will be calm. And it is. That's mind blowing. The guy who's like, I don't want to deliver the word of the Lord. I don't want to do my job as a prophet. The mouthpiece of God goes the wrong way, gets into the wrong boat, causes this problem for these people, these sailors, is destroying a portion at least of their livelihood as they're throwing their goods into the ocean. And he says, hey, you guys want this to be solved? Throw me in the water. And they throw them in the water and it's solved for them. This would be in a parallel and a foreshadowing of Jesus who claims, as we read, is greater than Jonah. That you would have substitutional sacrifice for these men's lives. How crazy is it that this guy doesn't want to send the message of the Lord of mercy and grace outside of the people of Israel, God's chosen people. He doesn't want it to expand. And now he's on a boat with pagans who are more sensitive to God than he is, asking him to call on his God because their gods aren't cutting it. Their gods aren't doing anything. Responds, he says, This is what you got to do. They do it. They, before they do, they plead and they pray and they say, Any other way? Sound familiar? Okay, don't, don't charge us of this innocent man's blood. And they, and they throw him in and it is calm. And then, and it is then, not in the midst of the storm, but in the calm, that these guys make vows and sacrifice to God. Real conversion. Not in a freak out, grasping for God moment, which can happen and does. But in a moment when they experience it. You know where the other parallels bring me to? The story of the disciples on the Sea of Galilee in the storm. No sin that we know of that brought that storm on. Just a tough situation going on for these boys. And Jesus is sleeping in the boat. Whoa. And in both accounts, both in Jonah and in Jesus, calming the storm, we are told that the men in the boat fear more after the storm is calmed. And these guys exemplify in this first chapter 
not Jonah, who says he fears the Lord God when asked why this is happening. These men, these heathens, pagans, fear the Lord more and more and more. This struggle between what is good and what is right and what is good for me. Do you believe that what God has for you is good? Like he says it is over and over and over in his word. Or we struggle with, because we do, I'll answer for you. Yes, we do. We struggle with the world telling us, that ain't good for you, Mitch. This is good. This is great. I struggle significantly, and it frustrates me that I do, with what is the will of God for my life? What am I supposed to do? And a lot of people want to tell me what that is. And I'm like, hey, I want to hear from the Lord. Okay, here's why it frustrates me. It's pretty plain and clear in scripture what the will of the Lord is for my life. I've just decided that like what I do vocationally matters more for some reason. God spells it out plain. He says, this is the will for your life. Most significantly, most notably, maybe most memorably in 1 Thessalonians when he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you would be set apart. That yes, the world is going to tell you that you should live in such a way you're supposed to be different than that. You're supposed to be in the world and not of the world. It goes on and says the very first way is that you would be pure. That you would abstain from sexual immorality. And if we're really honest with ourselves this morning, that's probably the tip top thing that we struggle with the most in what God tells us we should be living and what the world is screaming and trying to shove down your and my throats and our kids' throats every single day, every single minute. Amen. And we struggle with it. The world's telling me this thing about sexual desires and goodness and whatever, and God is telling me the complete opposite. And what are we living for? And you want to know what the will of the Lord is past that when we won't submit to that will? kind of out of bounds and out of business. You can keep going because God would say, this is the will for your life, your thankfulness. That you would be thankful in all things, even in the storm. And in this situation, the storm that comes from him that would chase after this man of God and bring him back and want to extend grace to this man, not once but twice in this book. And we'll believe that it is probably Jonah who pens this book so that we would know and be able to learn from his mistakes and the life that he led at the time. I would love to know if you ever met these sailors again who think he's dead and gone. That would have been wild. And what potentially those guys were up to for the Lord. There's this part where he says in his prophecy of, hey, throw me in. He's saying to them, the, the sea will be calm for you. It will be better for you. This is the substitutional sacrifice again. My life for yours. As Jesus does for you and for me and every single person who's ever lived. His life for ours. So that we might know God and might be able to be in his presence now and forevermore. And Jonah struggles with, will continue to struggle with in this book, suicide ideation. It'd be better if I was gone. Because you need to see and understand him, you and me, are made to live in the presence of God. We're created for him and to him, we are told. And so when we don't, and when we flee and when we live our lives contrary to his will and his presence in our life, there is a battle that rages inside of us between our flesh and the spirit. That ultimately gets us to a point of my life or his. And Jonah's in the spot of take my life. And this is why we've decided to do baptism. Because that's exactly what baptism is. Death to that old life. And that when we 
would be buried with Christ, we're told in Romans 6, and we would come up new. Galatians would tell us, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That my life is gone. It's his life now in me. Here's the thing. Here's a trap. Here's the expansion of five years ago. And I said, a lot of times we come to church to flee the presence of God. When we try to avoid sin in our own power, in our own ability, we are avoiding Jesus. It's uncomfortable. And we don't want it to be true, but it is. And we've lived it. I have. We would be like, I, I can go do this. And I can be in control. And I can fight these things. And I can live away. Or I can choose when I do and when I don't. If you think you can beat sin, sin still rules your life. You're giving it the power. Because you cannot beat it. You need someone to do it for you. You need substitutional sacrifice. You need what Jesus offers you on the cross where he says, I do it. I will do it for you. Not just for you, but for everyone. Take on the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. Everyone does it for you. And then we're going to accept that, believe that we need it, and then go live and try to do it on our own now? doesn't make sense. And we need exactly what baptism exemplifies and the struggle that I believe is in Jonah. History would record is buried in his hometown just a little ways north of Nazareth. That it would be better if the flesh for you, for this church, for your family, for your workplace, for your na- it was put to death. And exactly what baptism is. Public, showing, explanation of what's happening inside. And sometimes we need to do these physical acts like that to set our faith straight. And take the step of obedience. Beautiful is the story of Jesus who by no means needed to be baptized but sets the example for us and it says in Matthew 3 verse 13 then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him and John tried to prevent him I need to be baptized by you are you coming to me Jesus answered and said to him permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is offered to you and offered to me as a son of God, daughter of God. Not that we would as a son or I would as a son be looked upon by God and said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. I believe that he does, but it's because Jesus has taken my place place. And so when he looks to me, he doesn't see me, Mitch, filthy, ragged. My best day is filthy rags, scripture tells us, but sees his son and the same thing offered to you and to me. And to follow an example, I love every time we baptize someone, pray with them and get to say, because I feel like these are few and far. They actually aren't, but Our flesh gets in the way. But to be able to know and to sit in and be in this moment where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt is exactly what God wants you to be doing. Step of obedience into baptism. Doing exactly what what Jesus did and exemplifying publicly in, yeah, sure, a weird way. I'm going to dunk you under the water and bring you back up. And this life change that it represents. The old you is dead and gone. And the way that we beat sin is not by trying to do it in our own power. And leaving it in some sort of control like something we need to beat. 
but by putting Christ on the throne and pursuing him. Trying to get closer to him, embracing his presence, not leaving it and trying to do our life our way is how we beat sin. You don't beat sin by trying not to sin. You beat sin by pressing into Jesus and trying to get closer to him. We like to blame this on youth. Often we're like the youth live in such a way and they always ask this question where they're pursuing how close can I get to sin? And I say we blame it on youth because we do the same thing as adults. I don't care how old we are. We live our life far more often flirting with some imaginary line of sin than in pursuing the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Absolutely mind-blowing to me and the cherry on top and the beauty and the depth of Scripture. And accidentally, I might add, as I was doing a little bit of a word study, stumbled upon Jonah's, the meaning of his name. Does anyone know what it is? His name means dove. I'd like to say, what are the chances of that? But they're pretty dang good because we're talking about God. Old Testament, what does the dove represent? Well, most notably comes from the story of Noah and the end of the flood. And it would signify new beginning, new possibility, new creation. The exact thing, Jonah, the exact message, he does not want to go to Nineveh. You guys have been living wicked. You want, you want new life? New, new possibilities, new creation? Like God's going to destroy you, but doesn't want that message to go to them. His namesake. What does it mean in the New Testament? Well, it comes from this moment when the Holy Spirit would descend like a dove and represents, can you believe it, the presence of God. That's what the guy's name who's running from the presence of God means. What? Incredible. Amazing. Beautiful is this. You say, Jonah, this is who you're supposed to be. This is who you are. And this is what you're supposed to bring this message, the greatest message ever, and the foreshadowing of the greatest news, that being the gospel, the good news, the world has ever known, you're supposed to bring it to everybody. To the worst of the worst. And you got to realize, like Jonah needs to realize, and Semi does next week in chapter 2, he is no more deserving of the mercy and grace than the evil Ninevites. He is just as wretched and sinful as they. As so are you and me. As Paul would claim and say, he is the chief sinner. Writer of the majority of the New Testament. Chief among sinners. Undeserving are each and every one of us. And possibly more undeserving is this man, the man of God, the prophet of God, not willing to live according to the call and the will and the presence of God in his life. And yet after him is the personal chasing of God the Father that he might turn him and bring him continually into his grace. I'll bring you in on a little secret. It was Wednesday and my dad was like, I got an idea. What if we do a baptism? I was like, I love it. It's awesome. It's perfect. It matches up. That old life needs to be put to death as Jonah thinks he's going to his death, being thrown into the water. Awesome. He goes, what if we do it every week of the series? So we're going to do it. Today and the next three weeks, that pool is going to be out in the courtyard. And we're going to baptize. And we're going to do baptism. And we're, going to, we're going to offer that to everyone who comes. You'll be like, man, that's awesome. Maybe I'll do it next week. Caution on that. I can promise you the pool will be there next week. I cannot promise you we will be. Like, let's be real. You might not be here. We might not be here. Today is the day of salvation. Be like, well, I didn't bring clothes. Don't let these excuses 
leave you from what you know the Lord wants to do in your life. The step of obedience you're supposed to take this morning and today. Well, my family's not here. Well, maybe what your faith needs is for it to be your decision and not something they're included on. You and him. When we go to camp, Josh shared this summer and all the kids that got baptized, uh, we do baptisms in the cove there at Hume Lake. And uh, I, would, uh, I would never offer it. It always had to be asked. Because I wanted it to be real and authentic. And not just something you do up in the mountain because you're on this camp high, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But, but a real choice. So I wouldn't offer it. I wanted it to be asked. If you ask, then we'll do it. I wouldn't even present that, but it's not going to be something we always do. And it's not something we always do here, but it will be something we do for the next four weeks. And maybe something you know that you need to do, and I pray that you would not. And maybe so uncomfortable to be said this way, flee the presence of God and walk off this campus without doing it. And maybe you need to do it again. Maybe you're like, I've been baptized, but I feel like I need to be baptized again. I didn't fully understand or was a kid or whatever it is. I'm in a weird position because I got baptized, I think I was 13 years old. Ahoy Shores. I've got this Bible, you know, written in it, day of baptism. Now also on top of that, I got saved every weekend for about five years at this church. Sunday school. Uh, but I didn't fully give my life to the Lord until sophomore in high school, Spanish class, period six, Torrey Pines High School. And maybe that's you this morning. You're like, man, I got I to gotta put to, to death my, my life. He's in charge. I accepted salvation. I wanted the, I wanted the substitutional sacrifice that Jesus offers but I didn't want to take the Lord part of the Lord and Savior and say, Jesus, you're on the throne. And I talked about it and said already, if he's not on the throne, sin's on the throne. You're like, well, I'm not living for sin. I'm not doing that. Listen, if he's not on the throne, then sin's on the throne. Because if, if it's not him and it's not blatantly sin, then it's you. And you are a sinner, as am I. Sinner saved by grace. Need to follow in the step, take the plunge and accept the fact that it'd be better if you just got wet. You gonna let how your hair looks? Or what plans you might have later? I know you're all rooting for the Raiders with me. It's going to be a bad year. Why? Let it get in the way. Just do it. And know and live in and be in this moment of like, this is exactly what the Lord wants you to do. Ask for each and every one of us to be more like him. And he says, doesn't say he does it. Maybe it's what it, it takes for, for you to get off the throne of your own life and give it to him. Say, I want, I, I, want this, I want the substitution. I want my sins forgiven. I'm struggling with the Lord part. We'll go be buried with him in the waters of baptism and be brought up brand new. Lord, I love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this story this life of Jonah for us to, to learn from, to be challenged by, and a challenge, a step of obedience for us in the courtyard, some of us in the courtyard. We don't have to leave, we don't have to leave this campus before we might be challenged by your word this morning. And would our first steps outside of this room be steps of obedience. Not, it's not a question of being equipped or being ready. We'll never be ready. 
I'm not qualified. But Lord, would we be obedient and more obedient than Jonah, quick to obedience, running, desiring, pursuing your presence in our life. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We praise you this morning. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen.